So, um, my name is Jans Aasman. I'm the CEO of uh, France Inc. And our main product is uh, a graph database, an RDF graph database. And, um, but I put this thing up here because when I was 22, I made my first money with writing software. I was working at a, um, a traffic science institute in the Netherlands. And we wrote a simulator so that people on bikes could see a screen with an intersection with cars driving on the intersection. And then the students could, uh, with a, a cursor, control their little bike, because the Netherlands is more bikes than cars, and to try to get a life over the intersection. Yeah, so, and when I would give a talk, I always had my cars there <laughs> driving on the screen, and then bicycles, and then once every 20 seconds, one of the bicycles would be killed. And so I would just start my talk and everyone would look to see whether someone would die or not. So anyway, that's, the, that's why I show this thing here. It's kind of a fond memory of a long time ago. But I'll talk about this thing later. Yeah? So what I'm going to talk about is uh, geospatial processing and tracking moving objects in an RDF graph database. So I'll first, before I talk about geospatial, I will talk a little bit about RDF graph databases and linked open data. So who, who has worked here with RDF? One, two. And who's worked with the graph database? Ah, a lot more, that's good, all right. So I'll first talk a little bit about an RDF graph database. Um, and then I'll switch to how we deal with geospatial information in our RDF graph database. It's called Allegro Graph, by the way. Um, and so I do a few demos, and I'll talk about a few real-life use cases. I talk about uh, how we enrich data that we scrape from Google and Bing. Yeah? So we can do very advanced queries. Um, I talk about um, something we did uh, for a command and control uh, uh, system for the military. Now, when I talk about a little part, it can't be taped, yeah? because I am under, under NDA. I can show it in public, but not put it on the internet. Um, I'll talk about a customer of ours, Siemens, that, is, uh, that wrote a prize-winning uh, application that saves about $10 million a year in that company, uh, based on our triple store, but also uh, very, very geospatial. And I talk about an online banking example. So who saw my online banking example yesterday? One? Okay, good, that's good, and I, maybe two. I'll do that again a little bit. And then I talk about um, the main part, this is moving objects. So we have some patents in our database for 2D and 3D uh, geospatial indexing. So I'll talk about the principles of that, and then I, I will go into what kind of applications can you do with moving objects, and I'll do my demo again with the ships, and I'll show you how you can do queries over that data. All right? So first, I mean, I guess you guys all know about graph databases. Um, yeah, instead of rows and columns, you have nodes and links between nodes. And actually, the only difference with a graph database and an RDF graph database is that the nodes in your um, database and the links between the nodes are unique URLs. Yeah? And that gives you an enormous advantage, because what you can do is you can have multiple databases all over the place. And as long as people take care that they use the same names, then suddenly I can combine information. Yeah? And I can do queries that, that touch many, many different databases at the same time. And this is all based on W3C uh, uh, standards. Well, you, you guys know that uh, knowledge graphs and graph search are in. Yeah? All our huge, uh, our big area companies build huge proprietary knowledge graphs. We have Google that's building the knowledge graph so that if you go and, uh, and search in Google for Leonardo da Vinci, then you get this page, and on the right-hand side, you see a lot of information. So basically what Google is doing is building like an encyclopedia of everything they can find in the world, every important person, every place, every organization, every product, with all the relationships between them. And their architecture looks very much like an RDF graph database. Then, um, of course, you know about Facebook and the graph search, you know about LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn. But did you guys know that there's a beautiful, much bigger knowledge graph out there called the Linked Open Data Cloud. Who, who knows about Linked Open Data? One. Um, that's, that's not many. All right, so what is it? So in 2002 or three, people started with uh, 
the standard for RDF, or the research, uh, Resource Description Framework, work, which basically is a way of describing objects in the form of triples. Yeah? And already in 2007, there were a whole bunch of databases out there um, that were, um, well, that you could use and were publicly available. So for example, you see here the DBpedia, which currently is about 1.8 billion triples that describe all the contents of the Wikipedia. Yeah? So this is a fantastic encyclopedia that's now machine readable. Then you have GeoNames, yeah? a, a database with 7 million places on Earth with latitude, longitude, the alternative names, etc. You might have the US Census database of, 2000, uh, uh, of the year 2000. And what you see is that all these databases are linked together. Well, actually, I say databases, but most of, the, most of them are or just files with uh, millions and billions of triples or Sparkle endpoints, where Sparkle is the query language for IDF graph databases. Yeah? So just to give you the principle, one, one demo that I sometimes do is where I say, so what was the average income of the place where Barack Obama was born? And most of the time I get this, this thing about, yeah, but that's in Kenya. And they don't have the U.S. Census database. But once we get past that stupid joke, yeah, I can tell people that I have Barack Obama. I look him up in the DBpedia. I find where he's born. I go to GeoNames. I find the latitude longitude. I find, say, all the cities within 10 miles of that point. Then I go to the U.S. Census database and I find the income. Yeah, and I do an average on that. I can do that query in about 100 milliseconds. So I can, I can talk to three databases, I can answer a, a fairly complex question and, get the, and, and use these publicly available data sources. Now this was 2007. This was the same picture of 2011, and after that they gave up. Yeah. Um, huh? Gave up in the picture. They gave up in the picture, sorry, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so this alone are um, about 20 billion triples uh, in the domain of um, uh, life sciences. For example, you might have a database with about 100,000 clinical trials or 1,800 drugs or uh, 4,000 diseases. Um, and here you have a whole bunch of databases that are all geospatially oriented. So you might have linked sensor data, you might have the fishes in Texas, you might have geospecies, species, the World Factbook, geonames, uh, linked geodata, ocean drilling codes. Anyway, yeah, you get this is a, a massive amount of stuff all that, that are centered around geospatial and of course all linked to other data sets all over the place. And guess who made this particular picture? The people from DBpedia because they're in the middle. But they're actually also an amazing, fantastic data set, so they deserve to be in the middle, all right? So that's a little bit about IDF graph databases, about linked open data, but that's just a background because I promised, promised to talk about geospatial and moving objects. So in our graph database, we have implemented geospatial reasoning. And what we've done is that we, um, and I'll talk about that later, but we have created a special 2D and 3D indexing so that if I have a particular event, something that happened somewhere, I can find all the events that happened within five miles extremely fast. And also we implemented polygons. So if, you've, if you have city boundaries or any kind of polygon, we can tell you all the objects in this polygon in record time. Yeah, so that is our geospatial indexing details. And, and by the way, you can use both uh, a normal coordinate system or you can use the sphere of the Earth. Yeah? So we implement both uh, uh, forms of geospatial uh, coding. And then I'll talk about this later, but we also do temporal reasoning. So there's many ways times can relate, durations can relate to each other. And we wrote utility functions so you don't have to write a whole bunch of code to say something about time. We just made it very easy to say something about when something happened. Okay, so that about the background. And now let me show you some applications where people uh, use this geospatial. So the first demo is actually already a demo that I created about two, three years ago, but that's, I showed this demo all over the place, but I'm fairly new at NoSQL, the, the, the uh, conference, so let me do it here. So what we did is we, um, we spied at Google 
and Bing very carefully, otherwise they kick you out and you can't access them for days. Yeah. So you spider, then you get HTML pages or other pages, and we extract all the people, places, organizations, events, and important events, uh, verbs from the HTML. HTML, okay, well anyway. Then what we do is we take, we link the people to this fantastic encyclopedia called the DBpedia. We take the places and we link them to uh, GeoNames or the US Census database. We take the organizations that we find and we link them to Freebase and DBpedia. Yeah? So now I know much more about these people. Uh, it's very complicated. That's one of the hardest problems in, the, in business is you have a customer database, you use company, and your customer will be in 20 different places because, just because the names are different. Yeah? So what we have to do, you find Obama, well then you, well there's all kinds of tricks that you need to do just to find a name. And then if you have people with the same name, what you do is you take all the text in the DBpedia and all the text around in a newspaper article and you do some kind of intersection search to see to do kind of disambiguation. If you get the most matches for the word surrounding, then that's probably the person. You never can be sure, yeah? especially if you call John Smith. But for so, so this is the architecture we use. You, we, can we have spiders that, that we can control with URLs or word lists or taxonomies. We, we get information from the web. We apply text extractors or scrapers. We get, the inf we get all the places, organizations, and people out. We store them in our database. We link it to the linked open data cloud. We also put it in solar for special indexing. And then I can show uh, your data and I can query your data with our visualization tool. And this is the kind of queries we can do. We can say, well, which Republican talked to an oil company less than 100 miles of Tampa two weeks ago? Yeah. Try to type that query in Google. It won't help you yet. Yet it will come soon. But I mean, um, because they now have the knowledge graph, so they're working on this, but we, you can do this and implement it yourself in the triple store. Or find a newspaper article with a Democrat and a Republican that are on the same committee and have the same, uh, same religion. Yeah? Um, or which scientists were mentioned in the news yesterday that also mentioned a city that was less than 100 miles of Tampa. Again, all that stuff you can't ask Google or ask.com. You have to enrich your data before you can ask those quer queries. And as I said, within the two, three years, Google will be able to do this. So demo, so I have, oh, I've got a lot of time. Okay, so here is a tool called Graph. It's a graphical interface to our database. And what I've done already is I opened uh, the database entity Google. And is there anything in the news you're really interested in other than Obama, maybe healthcare, maybe the CIA, NSA, all kinds of cool topics. The baseball. Baseball? Oh, oh sorry. There was oh, no, this, this is an older demo. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. We have some newspaper articles. Oh, okay. So this is a one day of Google, yeah? And I can look that up. And so here are three texts that have the word baseball in it. So I do, I do a free text indexing. I double click and here you see the, the triples that make up the graph. So I see that this text um, has some important concepts, has some uh, organizations like the American League, the Baltimore, or well, whatever, some people, some places that are mentioned. And then we link the things, things to GeoNames. Let me find one that is actually in GeoNames. Okay, so in that newspaper article was also a place. I linked it to GeoNames, so now I can show you the triples that I come from GeoNames. It's about KS, Kansas City, uh, which has about 140,000 people. This is the latitude and the longitude. It's a populated area. It's uh, 200, how high is it actually? Oh, 266 meters, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you get the point? And I did the same thing for people, so I could look at uh, James Shields, and it would find someone that's probably incorrect in this case, because it's from the American Civil War. Yeah. Um, but you see what I did? I took a name that the entity extractor found, just a, a dumb string, and I looked it up in DBPD, and I find more information about that person. Um, so now, 
given that I have that, oh, by the way, I can explore this graph on the screen. So if I say, well, I want to explore this graph, but only look at organizations, people, and places, I could say, well, let's look at this, and let's look at this text, and this text, and let's reformat a little bit. And what you see that all these clouds are actually little independent clouds. I don't have that often. So let me see if I can find any link to this thing. Oh, yeah. So there's one, one way to link this text to the other text. Can I maybe this poor little lonely thingy here linked here? Yes, I can do that too. Yeah, so I can use the graph database to do my own linking and seeing how I can find from one graph to the other graph and then just explore. Can you see what's the meaning of that link? That you yeah, here you see the names of the links. So it has link data name or has a place. So if I do this, you see that if I click on has people, you see all the people here. If I look at the types of objects, I can see places here. Does it make sense? So the colors of the, these things are the nodes and the links are here and here you see the, the so meaning. The reason it didn't link those three groups initially is because you filtered it just by three relationship types. What I did is I said exp explode this node using these three link names. Yeah. And somehow they didn't hook up. It's the first time ever in when I do a demo that it happened. Yeah. <laughs> But then I said, ask the database, can you find the shortest path from this thingy that I have here and this thingy that I have here? And using the three predicates that I selected, can I find any link between the two? Any type of link? Any find of a link, yeah. I mean, I could, I could use any, yeah, I could take another predicate. I could take these guys away. So the link is characterized by the label itself. Yeah. It's the link type. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, let's not, let's not, because otherwise I get later in trouble, but. Yeah. And I can do, I can say, can I, I don't know if there's any NSA for this day in here. No, not for the NSA, maybe the CIA. So here's some text about the CIA. And I probably can link the text to the CIA, uh, <laughs> to Associated Press. Okay. So we do this too for life science databases where I have a gene here and a drug here, and I can say, Show me all the links that I can find through um, uh, clinical trials or drug interactions or whatever. Yeah? So this works for any kind of thing you can imagine. Does this all make sense? Okay, so now you want to do these queries I talked about. Um, let me do it first another query. Um, Yeah, I could just select all the predicates. Usually there's a lot of nonsense in there, yeah, that because they, they just have the number one as a property of something, which is not really very un, un interesting. So, um, so the first query, which this is in a language called Sparkle, where I say, well, can I find a text that has a property link data, or a property, well, a link that's called has link data name X, where X has the word nip type scientist. Yeah? So this comes straight into the Geos DBpedia. And what I find there are about, f for that particular day, there were five, six um, scientists in the news. Yeah? So if I look at them, you see the guys that were in the news and the text they were linked to. And if I want to know, then again, so if there's any possible relationships, well, that's not, that's not interesting. There's no faster way to do this. Oops, and here's too many relationships. <laughs> anyway, this is, I can go back. So this is the uh, a question for ab about scientists, but now say I want to find all the scientists in a te text where the text also has the name that was within 100 miles of Tampa. Yeah, so now I have to actually look in the GeoNames database to find all the places within 100 miles, and then I have to look for scientists. So I do this query. Um, and I say, uh, yeah, so you probably can use this query. You say text with city and radius, text tempo 100 miles. Yeah. Uh, so give me cities that are within 100 miles of tempo. Yeah, mentioned in the newspaper. Where the text has a person uh, that is a scientist, where the text has a particular title. So now when I do the query, 
I get it's text 540, name is Wil William Henry Phelps from Wichita, and the report sees a disparity in Medicare cost. Does it make sense? Do you see the power of this? Just by looking at Google, you couldn't see it, now you can see it, and the geospatial part is mixed in. So the next thing is, um, let me go to the next demo, or the next. So the question is, this is all fun, but do they use this in the enterprise? Well, Siemens recently, no, last year, built a mini Watson to answer natural language queries for salespeople about turbines. So Siemens maintains more than 100,000 turbines in the world, yeah? And that's a lot. And so um, you, you, the, the salespeople, but also the maintenance people, have a lot of queries, but all, these, all the, this data is in lots of different databases. So they wanted to get all these databases together and then ask very advanced queries. So they built, like Watson, a very interesting natural language system based on UEMA. And so this is the kind of questions they can do. What is a mega cluster? Give me all the active units in, in, in China. What are the service regions of New York, yeah, which is a, a geospatial factor, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a lot of this information is all in the Lego graph. But what you also can see here, like Watson, they use a lot of linked open data. Yeah? So please know that, uh, note that Watson uses many, many of these data sources. So Watson is one of the smartest systems on the planet. Yeah, people will easily give you that. It's heavily using the whole linked open data cloud. And so the mini Watson from Siemens uses the DBpedia, Freebase, GeoNames, and to our delight, Allegograph yeah, for the, to store all this data information. And this system won the Siemens Innovation Prize in 2013. It saves more than 10 million euros per year. And then they stopped counting this. Eh? It's a candidate for the AAAI 213 prize. And if you want to read the paper, then go to our booth and uh, we have copies of that paper there. Um, okay, so that is how they use it in the enterprise. Yesterday I talked about how we actually also use geospatial in um, a system that we're building with a big online bank. Yeah, and I, I think there was one person who's seen it, so I apologize, but I'm gonna explain it again. So imagine you have accounts that were opened at a particular time, at a particular IP address, uh, with a particular email address, a linking bank account, etc. Yeah, And then you have events. You have payment where the sender is an account, the receiver is an account at a particular IP address, a time, etc. Yeah? So a very simple graph. And what you want to find is interesting patterns that might indicate that there is fraud going on. So the use case, uh, the first use case that we, that we worked on, on in this thing is what they call collusion. People working together to get money out of the system. So, for example, you have, say, what you were looking for is, give me a bunch of accounts that were opened in one hour, yeah, and then within 30 minutes, other people send a huge amount of money and spread it out over these other accounts, and then in the next half hour, yeah, um, uh, the money flows out of these accounts and gets into the external accounts, yeah. Now, that is still all reasonable. There might be a group of people that want to go to on a vacation together, um, so the question is also, do the senders and the payers know each other? So what we do is we look at these accounts and we say, well, these guys are both connected to a, f a known fraudster. And these two people open, um, opened accounts from the same IP address. Yeah? And these two people did it from the same city or within 10 miles from each other. Yeah? So there's all kinds of a ge a geospatial and, and graph connections that you can make between these people. And you can do the same thing for the senders. And the more these people are connected, yeah, the fishier the whole thing gets. Does it make sense? All right. So for this case, the transactions were stored in Hadoop. We imported less than 10% of the data into Allegro Graph, only the, the graph itself, not all the other stuff that they need for their bookkeeping. And then we started finding these patterns in the data. And so let me do a quick, quick demo. I still have the time. Um, So this is a tiny demo running on my laptop. So the server is running in a VM, the graph is running in Windows and they're talking to each other. And the typical thing I would look for, well, is there a person here? I'm just showing you the basics of this little thing here. Um, 
yeah, I could say, well, you guys now know how the system works, so I'm choosing sender and receiver, yeah? And I can say, well, this here is the, uh, so I'm kind of looking, so what you see here, uh, let me just do a few here, and reformat, and they can make it a little bit smaller. Yeah, and I can stay in saying, can I, f so what you see here, the big ones are the accounts, the small one are the, the transactions. So if I look at an account, you see there was an account date time, there was it open, the IP address, the number, the account place. Actually, this is again in GeoNames. So if I look at GeoNames here, you see again the same triples you saw before in the Google demo, yeah. Um, and then you see the payments they made. Oh, he made a lot of payments. Okay, now, everything above this gray line is an outgoing link. Everything under the thick line is a relationship to you. Yeah, so, so this is what we call a, uh, yeah, still a buyer. So a lot of people that paid you money. You get the point, so how this all works? Yeah, so... We can do, this is the graph that we do our data on, but then when we do our geospatial queries, I go to the graph database for now, and, and then I don't want to go too deep, but what I wanted to show you, the power. So have you guys ever seen uh, Sparkle? Who has seen Sparkle before? One, two, yeah. Okay, so here you'll find something new, and I'm now talking only to the people that know Sparkle, yeah? So basically Sparkle, is a graph query language. One thing that we added to the graph query language, it's still valid sparkle, is that the predicate in the middle can now also be a function. So actually, instead of looking in the database to find a relationship, when the database sees this magical predicate, they call that, sorry, magical predicate of computed function, then actually it will do something in the programming environment and then go back to the graph. So here is a query that said, did the most important friends, friends did someone of the most important friends of Sonia make a payment within 100 miles of Rotterdam in New York in the last 10 years? Yeah. Now, you probably have no clue on how to read this if you not, don't know it, but let me just quickly try. So you say, give me a place with the label Rotterdam in New York that has a particular location. So this is a variable, yeah? And then look at the person with the email address, uh, account with the email address Sonia that has a group that is two levels deep using the paid relationship. So what, we what you see here is what they call a magic predicate. Then compute the degree, actor degree centrality in this group. So for each person in the group, you compute how important it is in the graph. Yeah. Um, and then you look for events where the sender is this particular member, has an email address and lives within 100 miles of Rotterdam. Yeah, and when you do the query, you get the results here. It's, it's actually only two people that made all these payments. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? But what's the question? It's a mix of graph search, and then, for example, here, yeah? So, for example, we say, if the, does a member have an email, email, then you actually look in the database to find, given that you know the email, um, what the member was. So, say you know what the member is, then you can find what the email is. You do that directly in the, a lookup in the graph. But the next line, France Geo in circle miles, is actually a function that computes that is computed and then re returns results. So actually the Sparkle looks now a lot more like Prolog if people are familiar with Prolog. Yeah, we, we can now build functions into the Sparkle. It's still completely valid, 100% W3C compliant Sparkle code. Yeah, um, but uh, it's gotten a lot more interesting. <laughs> all right? Yes, are you providing all these uh, functions or can be extended to? Uh, right now we have, all these things are built by us. In the next version, we make that something where you can write this in JavaScript or in Lisp. So if a JavaScript to machine code compiler, where you can write your functions in JavaScript and then you can hang this in Sparkle. So you can do much more. All right, okay. Um, so this is a quick little demo. 
Um, I hope you get the, the gist of what I was trying to show here. And then let me go back to my presentation. So then about moving objects. Where am I here? Yeah. So we don't have many patents in our database, but our 2D and 3D geospatial indexing is patented. And basically what we do is say you want to find things on the surface of the Earth. You have to find, you have to, to tell the system that you want to find, the f that you want to define the, world in define the world in strips. So basically what we do is we take, you say I want to use strips that are five mile wide and then within the strips we have sorted the data. This is described on our website and once we did this patent and got it then we decided that we found out that Google and Microsoft are actually doing the same thing so it's not, but that's hap what happens to patents here. So anyway, so if you now want to say give me everything within two miles of Berkeley then actually you have to need only one disk I.O. because you say, well, I know what Berkeley is. I look in geonames to find the latitude and the longitude. I have the longitude and the longitude and the latitude. I can compute the strip size, the strip, the strip number, and then within the strip number, I can go straight into our indexing with one disk I.O. I can find the, the things close to this particular to, to Berkeley. Yeah? So that was a technique that we dis that we designed. Now, if you make your strip size too small, then you actually have to look at multiple strips. So now you have multiple disk IOs. But most of the time, you kind of come up, come up with reasonable strip sizes. And what we do is actually compute uh, maybe one for five mile if you have to want to look in the city, and a hundred mile if you want to look between cities. Does it make sense? So we, you can actually have multiple indices on geospatial. I'm, not I'm going to do that now, yeah? <laughs> Thank you very much for this question. So, <laughs> so this was 2D, where, where we defied a plane or the world in strips. And then we did 3D, where again in 80, by 80 bits, we now have a time strip, and then a latitude strip, a longitude strip, and then the time modulus and the lat modulus. So now we have defied the world in blocks. So now if you say, for a particular point in the world, given this particular time point or duration, yeah, again with one disk I.O. I can just jump straight to the point on disk where probably your data will be. Again, if the time is bigger or the block is bigger, you have to look in multiple places. But if you do it, you choose the right strip size for time and space, one disk I.O. and you get your data. Um, and so now we can do things where we look, both look at time and space in a much more efficient way. In the bank demo, you saw I was looking 100 miles in around a particular Rotterdam, but you saw I also looked in a particular time interval. Yeah? But we had to do a join for the two. Now I can do a joinless search both for time and for space. Yeah? And with that, we are looking at multiple projects right now. We can track data for animals in a biodiversity project. Uh, we can track ships near the coast of uh, Africa. So you want to know whether two boats are close to the other, whether it's a pirate thing going on. Um, people are looking at this for trucks and airplanes and ships and for telephone services. Yeah. And then, of course, there are government agencies that do the same thing. And we don't... Okay, well, let's not go there. <laughs> so we, um, as I said, we track ships in the Bay Area. So uh, using AIS data, Anyone ever heard of AIS? So every, every big boat is required by law, by sea law, international law, to tell every so many seconds where you are, yeah, so that they can track you automatically um, and warn you if things go wrong, if you get too close to each other. So actually there's a whole database called marinetraffic.com, yeah, where you can get these maps with boats and you can download the AIS data from there. It's very interesting data sets to work with. And then as I showed you before, at the beginning of this talk, uh, yeah. So one of the questions that we want to answer for this project close to Africa is: Here are two boats very close together for a while. Yeah, are there two, a few boats in the same spot 
for more than an hour. Because then they might be transferring drugs or, or people or just uh, have a party, whatever. But you want to know, you want to know what's going on. Um, so we have this data, we do our experiments with this. And how does that look like? Uh, let me see if I can actually do this here. Um, yeah, they, they won't have AIS. So there's also satellite data for the same data. So for the project we're doing, you have satellite data and AIS data. For the ship demo here, we only use AIS data. That makes I mean, yeah, the, the, the pirates won't have AIS. <laughs> um, if I can find the address one. Yeah, maybe this one. Okay, let me do it this way. So the kind of query you can do, which in this case is in, um, in, in Prolog, but I can do this in Sparkle too in the next version, yeah, where you say, well, you, know, you guys know what half assigned distance is. It's, it's like distance between two points, but taking into account the curvature of the Earth. And so we can say triple inside half assigned miles, given a particular triple uh, that is at, and people that live in the Bay Area know that this is less longitude of the Bay Area, yeah? in this particular hour, yeah? So give me those, I can execute that, and I get the subjects at this particular point. So we already have this implemented, in and in, um, we'll try to make it more user-friendly right now, but it, like the Sparkle query I showed you earlier, this will be um, in the product. Okay, so, and then I'm almost done. Let's see here. So then we wrote a paper that I think is also at our booth about the performance of this particular new capability. And uh, we also we wrote a paper about the complexity of this and why it's important that you need to have this particular 3D indexing. So for example, what is simpler to do is to say, what is within a given bound from a given let long time? So you have a, a location and then the time, just a block, a 3D block, and then it's just one disk I.O. If you say, detect when two given moving objects are within a given distance, yeah, it gets harder, but now you have to traverse both of these lines already, and the computation has to be fast. Uh, if you say, given a moving object, detail, detect all moving objects ever within a given distance, it gets even harder, and I'm not even going to explain it, but um, it's a beautiful paper about the, the space-time complexity of doing this particular kind of search. And that was all I want to say today. Thank you very much. So, any questions? Yeah. So, one is, uh, so you, you do the grid, right? So yeah. So, how is the grid? So, uh, I believe you also look at the poetry, art tree, and so those kind of like special effects. So, can you say the reason why you didn't choose the, the poetry, art tree type of the approach that you use the grid one? Well, in the reason was we wanted something that fit into our existing. Uh, indexing scheme, and that's why we chose. I can do this offline. This is far too technical. Far too technical. Hi, Anne. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, you seem to the, the applications of three-dimensional uh, analysis queries seem obvious. Are there n-dimensional queries that would be interesting as well? And have you toyed with four D? Four D. Well, we're looking into four D, where you have that long and start time, end time, because that's another big problem. Even with 3D, it's hard if you have very long events or very short events. If you want to say, we're two people together at a particular time, a duration, 
and these are very long durations and you have the strip size, it gets really, really, gets unhappy. So we need to work on 4D where we actually can do indexing on, it's the same with geospatial, by the way, you can do the same thing for time, yeah, with a, um, a strip size for durations. So we know how to do it, but that's, that's the next challenge. Yeah. Or had similar blood pressure. Yeah. And then you have to do joints. Yeah, okay. Well, you, I, I understand what you mean. Yeah, you can do. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if it's an interesting problem. Though. Yeah. Um, well, we have an easy solution to 4D. Because in our triple store, we can traverse 2 million triples per second when we read through. So if, if say, we take latitude longitude and we. Um, we have a particular area and the number, well, the, the time variation is much smaller than the geospatial location, then we can, well, if the time variation is smaller, then we do T, X, Y. If, the, if it's vice versa, then we, do, then we do X, Y, T. It depends on what has the highest variability, so that you have to do the, the smallest number of, of lookups. But again, say you first look at lat long, then you have to maybe have to traverse a million triples. Then you can just go straight through them without doing any other beat research, just a straight read of the triples, and then just the checks whether things are in a particular duration. That's, you know, that's, then you can do an easy 4D thing. But it would be better if it had real 4D indexing, because then again we jump to a much closer point, and you can get it down to milliseconds. But we haven't done that yet. Other questions? Or shall we stop? Okay, one more. Oh, you can use it also for height, but then you can't do time. <laughs> All right, thank you.